Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jocelyn Lamenta, News 8's medical reporter, your moderator for this symposium. Now, over the years, I've had the privilege of having a front row seat at Yale School of Medicine, watching some of the very best and the brightest in medical science develop breakthrough research and treatment, then educating you on those very subjects. And I've learned a great deal from the best and the brightest. It hasn't been easy to interview them, to be quite honest, to get the, to the simple terms, to get it to the point where people at home can understand but it's such important information that uh, it is challenging for me because obviously I'm not a scientist, but I have learned a lot from them. And uh, I love the fact that I have that, that privilege to come here and learn from them and then pass that so very important research information to all of the folks at home who really need to know what's going on here at the Yale School of Medicine. We are living longer thanks to what has evolved in medicine. But that has also led to complex issues, such as coping with multiple chronic conditions and the increasing number of people being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. I've done so many stories on, on Alzheimer's lately. Today, you will hear from leading researchers on aging and how their work will directly impact you and your loved ones. And just a few housekeeping reminders. Just want to remind everybody that we gave you the index card so that you can jot down a question for the Q&A, which will occur immediately following the last speaker. We will also have a break after the second speaker, a 10-minute break. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to you our first presenter. Dr. Mary Tinetti is the Gladys Phillips Crowfoot Professor of Medicine and Epidemiology at Yale School of Medicine and Chief of the Section of Geriatrics. She was the first investigator to identify that older adults at risk for falling and injury could be identified, that falls and injuries were associated with a range of serious adverse outcomes, and that multifactorial risk reduction strategies were effective as well as cost effective. Her current research focus is on clinical decision making for older adults in the face of multiple health conditions. Her subject? when one person has many diseases. Please welcome Dr. Mary Tinetti. Thank you, it uh, is really wonderful uh, to be here and I thank you very much our special guests um, who have, have uh, been here uh, with us and um, very happy to, to be able to be with you. So I wanna start with um, who my favorite adult is. No, <laughs> it was the side yeah. one. This is my favorite adult. Um, he's my father, 91 year old. Um, this, he had just climbed up uh, 1,200 uh, feet um, that's overlooking uh, Lake Superior. Going up was great, coming down, not so much. <laughs> um, but I also want to talk, tell you a story about Mrs. S, who's an 84 year old woman who has multiple chronic conditions, including high blood pressure. She previously had a heart attack, heart failure, many of the most common chronic conditions that older adults face uh, every day. She had multiple of them. She also, not atypically for people of her age with multiple chronic conditions, takes many medications. Coumadin, a blood thinner for her atrial fibrillation, three different uh, blood pressure medications that also help her heart failure, um, statin for her heart, two medications for her uh, diabetes, and an SSRI for her depression. Again, not terribly atypical for the millions of older adults in the United States. So Ms. Smith and Mrs. S and her doctor were really facing many of the same questions that we face every day. They sat down and were wondering, are these medications causing any harm? We know medications have many good effects, but we also know they have harmful effects. Given the number that she's taking, what kind of harm might be happening that we're not aware of? Second of all, are these medications helping what matters most to her? And third of all, the most important question that we ultimately want to be able to answer, what is the best combination of medications for Mrs. S that provides her benefit without harm, if at all possible? So the title of the today was past present and future. So I'm going to take you way to the past 
to the 17th century uh, when I first came to Yale. <laughs> and it's important to bear in mind that today's approach to disease really did evolve in the 17th century when the evolving technologies of that time included, um, for those of you who are historians, um, such groundbreaking technologies as stethoscopes and microscopes where for the very first time we were able to understand some of the pathology underlying the conditions that people faced. We were able to relate the symptoms and impairments that they had with these pathologies. And as humans, we love to create categories, so we started creating disease categories during the 17th century. As we move from the 17th century to the 20th century, these advances in our understanding of the pathology were matched to our understanding and capabilities in areas such as surgery and pharmacology. And for those botanists in the audience will recognize this is a foxglove, uh, one of the very earliest medications, um, digitalis. And so we were able to um, diagnose and treat diseases um, based on our understanding of the pathology. And we evolved the model of disease approach to healthcare, which still dominates our, our medical uh, establishment today and has been highly successful and is one of the many reasons why people are living longer. But it's also important to bear in mind when that disease approach evolved from the 17th to the 20th century, the average life expectancy was in the 40s as opposed to the 80s that we, we see today. Um, second of all, almost all health encounters were for acute injuries such as portrayed in this picture or for acute illness for which people either recovered or they died. There were very few people with chronic conditions and essentially nobody who had multiple simultaneous conditions as we evolved that approach to disease. Again, so it's been highly successful, but it's important to bear in mind what Mrs. S, who reflects the patient of the 21st century, multiple chronic conditions, many, many medications, and importantly, as I will tell you, vary in what matters most to them. So going back to that first question, are any of her medications causing her harm? As, as physicians, we are taught to above all do no harm. And so two, two sets of studies that we've recently completed here um, that, look at that look at that issue, are we causing harm to people like Mrs. S. The first study was the effect of antihypertensive blood pressure medications in older adults with multiple chronic conditions. We know from an array of very well-designed clinical trials where people are randomized to either receive the treatment or not that older adults do have benefit from blood pressure lowering medications. Fewer strokes, fewer heart attacks, less heart failure. But it's also important to bear in mind that these were healthy older adults, that almost to a study, older adults with multiple chronic conditions who are the more typical older adult were not included in these trials. So we don't know if those benefits for healthy older adults are also the same in people like Mrs. S. And also importantly is there is some emerging evidence of perhaps increased risk of fall injuries. And so what we did, we studied a representative sample of older adults throughout the United States who are over 65 years of old age who had hypertension. Average age, 80 years, two-thirds, 66% had three or more chronic conditions. Very different than the people in the clinical trials, but very, very much like the people we see in the clinic every single day. And we, um, by looking at the number of, of blood pressure medications and the doses, we're able to divide people into those who essentially had no antihypertensive medications for a range of reasons. Those that took one or two or those that took three or more. And as you can see, 14%, because we do a pretty good job in this country of treating hypertension, there's only 14% who took no medications. 55%, about half, two or uh, one or two, and 31% about three in 10 who took three or more blood, blood pressure medications. And basically what we did, we know that those who take medications are different than those that don't. So accounting for all the factors that we know of that may make, that may make people who take medications different than those that do, or those who take more different than those who take less, accounting for all of those factors, what we found was comparing to those people who took no anti 
uh, hypertensive medications, those that took one and two had no effect, no decrease in the likelihood of having a stroke or a heart attack in the three years of follow-up, nor those who took three or more. Very different from what we found in the clinical trials. But what we did find is that, again, people who took no um, um, blood pressure medications, adjusting for all those factors, making them look more alike, 40% um, increased risk in a serious fall injury, such as a hip fracture or a traumatic brain injury, with one to two medications, and about almost a 30% increase in very serious injuries for three or more medications. Interestingly enough, there was a decreased risk in death. One of the things we're postulating, perhaps it doesn't decrease the occurrence of a cardiovascular event, but maybe improves the mortality for those who have an event, and it's an area that we're still exploring. But what we do summarize is that in this population of real older adults, if you will, the larger amounts of antihypertensive medications seem to be associated with a decreased risk of death but an increased risk of very, very serious injuries, such as hip fractures and hip injuries, and at least in our population, no effect on cardiovascular events, or perhaps only a modest decrease um, compared to, particularly in strokes, compared to what we see in the randomized controlled trials. No single study, particularly observational studies where we didn't randomize people, tell us the whole story, and I don't want the take-home message to be that blood pressure medications don't work, but the implications are that we need to look further and not assume that what we see in healthy people are the same as people with multiple chronic conditions. And it may be perhaps that they do have different effective treatments, and we need to look at the effect in this population. It may help cardiovascular events such as stroke or MI, um, but certainly at the risk of an increased fall injury. And it really raised for us the question is, how common is this trade-off? One condition better, one condition worse in people with older adults with the treatments that we give them. So with the help of uh, Jonathan Lorgenpai, who's in the audience, who is now a third-year medical student, when he was a first-year medical student, worked with me on this uh, study of what we call therapeutic competition. And what that means is treatment of one disease, it helps. Treatment of other disease, it hurts. In Inherently, in multiple chronic conditions and treatments, we have trade-offs that we face. We help one condition, we hurt another, and we were just curious, how common is this in our population of older adults who take multiple medications? So we went back to that large, randomized, a red representative sample of older adults throughout the United States and looked at the 26 most commonly recommended classes of medication for the 14 most common chronic conditions that older adults have and asked the very simple question, how often did a medication for one condition potentially harm another condition? And to identify harm, we looked into the medical lit literature for evidence of, of medication harm on a condition, um, and based on a s relatively systematic review of the literature for adverse medications in another condition, we, we found that in this representative sample of older adults, 36%, over one in three, took at least one medication that helped one of their conditions but potentially hurt another. 20%, one out of five, took two or more, and 12% took three. Over one in 10 people took three medications that potentially could have harmed one of their conditions. Again, we don't know that they caused harm. This was the potential telling us we need to look further to see how often actual harm occurs. And the implications, again, is in quite common that a third of our population, we are prescribing a dis uh, based on disease guidelines that drive decision making in healthcare, potentially causing harm to our people unintentionally, meaning that we probably we need to start looking at medications and what's, what, what people should be on in a different way than it currently, currently do it. But it also begs the question, if it helps one condition but hurts another, are we treating what matters most to people? So that was another set of questions um, that our group did. And Terry Freed, um, who is my colleague also at the program in aging and, and uh, in, in a section, um, has also been a, a world leader on um, looking at um, trying to address the question of, of helping medica using medications that help what matters most. 
we looked at three different studies that address this question. The first was the direct trade-off in older adults. Again, went back to hypertension, high blood pressure, serious fall injury, two of the conditions that Mrs. S has, one out of three people over the age of 65 are at risk for a serious fall injury for a whole range of reasons and have high blood pressure. This is not a theoretical or rare trade-off. It's an incredibly common one. And as you remember, we, sh we found that there was a potential increased risk of serious fall injury with control of blood pressure. So we went out to greater New Haven area and identified 125 people who had both fall risk as well as high blood pressure, gave them the evidence, the best evidence we have of how much likely they are to decrease their chance of a stroke or heart attack with good blood pressure control with blood pressure medications versus the best evidence we have for the likelihood that we were going to increase their chance of a serious fall injury such, such as a hip fracture. And we were quite surprised to find exactly half of the people faced with that trade-off would say it was more important for them to avoid the stroke or heart attacks um, or, um, over, over they were willing to have a risk of fall injury or the medication effects such as dizziness or strokes, to uh, dizziness or, or uh, fatigue to avoid a stroke or heart attack. But the other half said it was more important for them to avoid uh, having a fall injury. Again, we expected people to really prioritize strokes and, and MI prevention, but people were 50-50, almost uh, equally split. Um, again, implying that older adults with multiple chronic conditions vary in what matters most to them. We cannot, as physicians, identify what we should be recommending to our parents, our patients. We need to get from them what's most important to them. But it also begs the question, it's really kind of stupid. I mean, would you rather have a stroke or a hip fracture? I mean, it's, I mean you know, it's, it's a little bit of a ridiculous question. So we went back and thought about it again. Well, wait a second, people with multiple chronic conditions, how do we really compare these treatments to really answer the question, have we caused benefit or have we caused harm? So we thought about it, is there something such as universal, what we call universal health outcomes? Are there health outcomes that are really meaningful to patients, that really matter to patients? that all conditions exert their effect on so that we could use these universal health outcomes rather than the individual outcomes such as stroke or heart attack. And are individuals able to prioritize when faced with that trade-off among these universal outcomes? And if so, can we use these universal outcomes to make decisions about benefits and harms? And so Dr. Freed has really taken the lead on this area, and indeed by asking a whole range of older adults um, throughout New Haven, really we're able to really get it down to three areas. And I suspect it's not a surprise to anybody in this audience. People want to be as functional as possible, and that could be act those daily activities such as getting here today, social activities, cognitive activities, but the people want to be functional. And they want to be as free of symptoms as possible, such as fatigue or pain. And they want to live as long as possible, survival. So essentially, we can take almost every possible health outcome and put it into one of these three categories. So it makes it much more simpler than trying to compare a hip fracture versus a stroke if we can compare function, symptoms, and survival. But that will only work if these chronic conditions really do affect these universal outcomes. So that was the next study we did. Again, going back to that big sample in the community, we looked at five common uh, chronic conditions, heart failure, chronic obstructive lung disease, osteoarthritis, depression, and dementia. And again, ask the question, if you account for all the other factors that affect daily functioning, activities of daily living, bathing, dressing, shopping, using the phone, using transportation, if you account for all of the other factors, and, and if you account for all the effect of all the other diseases here, do these individual five diseases affect these outcomes? And what we found is all five of them independently and very significantly accounted for changes in people's ability to carry out their daily activities. We found that arthritis, lung disease, depression, and heart failure all affected symptoms. Only de dementia did not affect symptoms, which is really what you would expect. And finally, 
chronic lung disease, dementia, depression, and heart failure all increase the likelihood that people would die. So again, what we were able to show in this study is that these, these chronic conditions did exert their effect on these universal outcomes, so perhaps these are the outcomes that we should be thinking about and deciding whether a treatment is really effective or not. But the next question we need to address is, well, then can individuals prioritize if there really is a trade-off, if we can't have it all? We all want to be as functional as possible, as free of symptoms, and live as long as possible. But what if we can't, can people prioritize so that we can make the decisions that are going to affect what matters most to them? So Dr. Fried and her group asked, again, a large, in three different studies in the greater New Haven area, asked older adults to, if you had to choose rank order the priorities among symptoms, function, and survival or death. And they were able to do this. And this was the findings, at least in, for greater New Haven. And, and this was all three of the studies combined. Difference in, in each of the three studies, but 42% thought function was most important, 32% uh, thought pain and other symptoms were most important, 27 prioritized survival. Again, people vary in what's most important to them, and we have to figure out how to incorporate that into the recommendations that we make and the research that we do. So again, people do think in terms of these universal outcomes. They are able to agree on a few outcomes. They are able to articulate their priorities, and they do vary in what matters most to them. So finally, it brings us to the future. And in a group, of, in a study that, uh, that Dr. Allure and, and McAvey and I are, are now doing, and again, a very large data set, what we call the health outcomes with medications in the elderly study, we are basically taking all of those most common chronic conditions that Mrs. S had, taking all of the medications that she's taking, and trying to say, can we identify using these universal health outcomes, can we identify which combination of these medications are most likely to give her benefit in the outcome that's most important to her and which are least likely to give her harm. And Dr. Allure um, did this nice little um, schematic for me, and if anybody can uh, tell in the audience that what that means, um, you get a gold star, I certainly can. But I'll translate it for you. What we are planning to do is to identify those outcomes of symptoms, function, and survival, take into account all those, the effect of all the chronic conditions, look at the effect of all the other factors that affect um, individuals' health in these areas, and those, all those uh, medications, and try to identify, again, singles for benefit versus harm so that we can say, you don't need to take 14 medications we are going to find for you your own personal pill that is the combination of medications that are best for you. That obviously is, is very, very much in the future. We have a very, very, very long way to go. Dr. Hodes is going to have to give us a lot more money to, uh, <laughs> to, uh, to get there, but that is definitely where those of us here at the Pepper Center are going in terms of trying to identify um, what works in clinical decision making with uh, chronic disease. I just want to end by thanking Dr. Hodes and the National Institute on Aging that supported all of this work I talked about today. A particular thanks to the um, older adults in greater New Haven who have just been quite generous in their times participating in all of our studies, and the wonderful uh, people at the program on aging, some of whom were brave enough to come for the picture, but all of those who were not as well. Thank you.